Reform Judaism, a denomination that accepts female rabbis without question, did not always hold this perspective. Many fears surrounded the concept of female rabbis, a concept that not only challenged a patriarchal Jewish tradition, but also gender role stereotypes. As a result, in 1977, the Central Conference of American Rabbis, CCAR, organized the Task Force on Women in the Rabbinate, which strived to promote the full acceptance of female rabbis. The first American female rabbi was Sally Presand, ordained by the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in 1972. In 1977, when the task force commenced, there were only three ordained women, but already enrolled rabbinical students promised 34 more in the following four years. During these years, women rabbis were not viewed as complete equals to their male counterparts. Their gender overshadowed their rightfully gained status. While the Central Conference of American Rabbis was ready to accept women rabbis, not all Reform congregations were prepared for this new addition. The organization understood that in order to advance congregant opinions to match the current reality of women rabbis, a clear definitive stance was required. The CCAR needed to demonstrate to the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, now the Union of Reform Judaism, that the emergence of women rabbis was not a passing fad, but a developing vocation for women. The task force understood that there was a need to adjust to a new situation. Congregations needed assistance in adaptation. A look at the years surrounding the task force will show the effect the second wave of American feminism had on the greater acceptance of women rabbis. From the 1960s to the 1990s, American society encountered changing gender norms. Norms were changing before everyone's eyes as more and more women chose to step out of the matriarchal domestic sphere and into the patriarchal professional sphere. However, the entryway of women into the workforce did not come without tension. This change caused great fear. Shifting societal scripts generated fears and myths about women that amplified stigma associated with professional women. These fears and myths worked against women's entry into the professional sphere. The most telling document from the work of the CCAR Task Force on Women in the Rabbinate comes from the notes of research consultant Dr. Herbert J. Freudenberger. You too can have your very own private viewing of this document at the Jacob Rader Marcus American Jewish Archives on the Cincinnati campus of Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. The document is found in box number 677. In 1980, Dr. Freudenberger was appointed to meet with congregants, boards, and senior rabbis and record their fears about hiring women as rabbis. These fears gave insight as to why women in the rabbinate were threatening. These fears are the core reasons for why the task force was needed in the first place. Seven main categories of fears and myths relating to women rabbis were noted. These included, one, a fear that women cannot do the job. Two, a fear that women in the rabbinate will not be able to balance a career and personal family life. Three, a fear that women will engender, create, or do already create competition and jealousy from women who are congregants. Four, a fear that women rabbis are too political, too new, too in, too fatty. Five, women carrying the Torah, wearing a talit and kippah does not appear right from an aesthetic point of view. Six, the rumor mill that women are not being hired in congregational positions and that they are not getting the jobs they want. And seven, a fear of women succeeding 
and that women who succeed will reflect poorly on their colleagues, as well as affect the mystique of the rabbi. These assumptions gave raw but honest perspectives of those opposed to hiring women rabbis. They revealed the existence of xenophobia, the fear of the unknown, or anything perceived as foreign or different. The rejection by congregations to women in the rabbinate was not a result of uneducated female rabbis who could not meet the same standards as male rabbinic candidates, but a result of fears to entertain the possibility of change, a change in societal norms, a change in the professional sphere, a change in traditional patriarchal Judaism, and a change to what had been the only accepted religious leader for a rabbi, a man. Dr. Freudenberger was able to get to the root of these sociological tensions of the time. His survey results helped to prove that in each generation, sociological fears prevent change. But through education, change is possible. Although it would have been more comfortable for the reform movement to maintain gender norms, it chose not to remain stagnant for fear of the unknown. Instead, the CCAR task force on women in the rabbinate enabled the movement to make great strides towards social change. Dr. Freudenberger's recorded feedback was used to train the task force's placement assistance teams. Through consciousness raising, the placement assistance teams facilitated congregational support of female rabbis. The teams traveled to congregations seeking to hire a new rabbi and prompted them on equal consideration of rabbinic candidates. Consciousness raising can be defined as any method for increasing interpersonal awareness or sensitivity by teaching people to experience a situation or point of view radically different from their own. Placement assistance teams used this method to heighten congregational awareness about gender discrimination and to promote the union's values of egalitarianism. By 1982, 10 women, including Rabbi Prisan, were solo rabbis of their congregations, and in 1984, 78 women had been ordained in total, with 20 in solo positions and 25 in assistant or associate positions. The Task Force on Women in the Rabbinate concluded in 1991. Rabbi Kaminsky, the chairman of the task force from 1979 to 1984, explains that in the 14 years of its existence, the task force on women in the rabbinate saw the female population of the reform rabbinate increase from three to over 150, serving in congregations of increasing size and geographic diversity, and in a wide variety of organizational positions. By 1991, women were serving on the executive board of the CCAR, and would soon after be officers. All problems on the task force agenda had not been resolved, but clear and measurable progress had been achieved in multiple areas, and women were visible and valued colleagues. The significance within Dr. Freudenberg's report is that it captured the tensions during a time of shifting societal norms. It revealed that women's problems were rooted in deeper sociological responses to the changing social scripts, and the placement assistance teams worked to address them. In every generation, society will be met with shifting norms, and it is up to us to decide what is more important, making a change or remaining the same while hiding behind our fears. The choice is ours. Change is in our hands. In the movie, The Princess Diaries, based on the novel by Meg Cabot, words of wisdom are given to the teenage Amelia, the sole heir of the kingdom of Genovia, who is deciding whether to accept her rightful throne as princess. Written in a letter by her deceased father, she is told, 
Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something else is more important than fear. The Central Conference of American Rabbis recognized that more important than fear was the chance for women to step into the professional sphere, the chance for women to follow their calling just like men, and the chance to lead the Jewish people. The advice for Amelia continues, reminding her that from now on, you will be traveling the road between who you think you are and who you can be. As women saw new possibilities for themselves, leaving traditional roles, they too traveled between who society thought they were and who they could truly be. Rabbis. The Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives on the historic Cincinnati campus of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion.